Good story. Well, my name is Reed Starkey. Can everybody hear me in the back? Good? Okay. So, um, so we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit. I, I didn't do a lot of slides because I don't feel like reading off the screen. I figured I would just talk and see how it goes. But so we're gonna focus on your first deal. Uh, there's a lot of reasons I think multifamily is much better than single family, but no offense, Todd. <laughs> um, so there's there's a lot of reasons, that, and I, I like some of the things you guys brought up because we're gonna talk a lot about how you bring together. Some of you said you had some money and you wanted to get into a deal. Uh, you know, others, you may have some experience, but need some money, and we, we kind of put those pieces together. So I think I think it'll be a good good lesson for all of us. So today uh, we're going to talk why invest in apartments. Money, no problem. Good syndication. So kind of that's everybody's biggest complaint is how am I going to get involved in apartments? With you know, I, I got you know, three three hundred bucks in my account. You know, what am I going to do? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, what market should you invest in? Uh, how do you find a deal? So uh, that's that's a big one. I think uh, I think Stu was mentioning how to find a deal. And how do you know if it's a deal? All right, so uh, why apartments? So Mike, you said you had apartments. Anybody else in here own any multifamily? So scalability. So the first uh, first time I got in, into the mind frame of apartments, so it was my one year anniversary for my first rental property. And uh, I had, had acquired five in the one year. So thinking like this is not going to work. So uh, this is uh, I'll be a millionaire by the time I die. <laughs> you know, and the, the real short of it is, you know, right now we're, we're negotiating a 150 unit uh, portfolio. So in one closing, it'll be 150 units. So, uh, it's a lot harder to get that 150 units, but it's definitely a lot easier than buying a house, refinancing, you know, rehabbing it, refinancing it. Process, as most of you refer to it as. So non-recourse. Now that's my favorite part. So it, you know, uh, I think it starts at seven hundred fifty thousand for Fannie Mae, but usually a million is, is an easy cutoff point. Um, if you're financing, you know, your single-family houses, you're signing on, you're signing a viable. So if something goes down with that property. Market crashes again. That's coming out of your pocket. They're coming after you for that money. Uh, at a certain size, it's non-recourse. They don't go after you. So you sign for it, but if you foreclose on it, they go after the building. They take it, and then it's, that's the end of the deal. Uh, and so that's part of why it's a lot easier to put the deal together because you can get people to sign for a deal that's you know seven million dollar deal, which I can't sign on the bottom line for it. But I can bring a partner in and say, look, it's not recourse. You know, just sign on it. <laughs> so there, there are some exceptions. So there's it's called the bad boy clause. Um, so if I was purposely stealing money out of the company, then, then they could come after me liable or after me personally or the person who signed for it. Um, but beyond that, if I'm just legitimately <coughs> trying to make the business work and something fails, then, you know, if it loses half of its value overnight, Give it back to the bank. Now the investors is another story. I'll have to lose face with all them, but hopefully that never happens. Uh, so the tax advantages; those are all the, pretty much the same as the single <coughs> family. Um, we could do the whole hour on, on the different tax advantages, but you know, essentially you're you're able to write off uh, you know, the, the value of the property over a certain amount of time, depending on how you how you structure it. You got the 1031 exchange to come out of it. It's fun. <laughs> so, you know, there's nothing more exciting than, than negotiating a deal for millions of dollars. You know, it's uh, uh, doing a hundred thousand dollar house is fun, but it gets to a point where you go to a closing and it's it's a more of a drag than, than anything else. And maybe multifamily will get there somewhere with me, but we're still it's still a deal. <coughs> Hooking a, a large multi-family property. So the buzz phrases apply. We'll talk about that a little later. But you know, I couldn't get out of there with saying, you know, the, the no money down. But 
typically I, I hate hearing those phrases so you might feel like you just sucked in or sell you something, but so again, no money. So what what is a syndication? A syndication is more than just real estate. You can send it, you know, banks do syndications, insurance companies doing syndications, you hear radio syndicates, television syndicates. Uh, basically it's when you wanna purchase something for more money than you have. And so you get together a bunch of people with the resources or money and have it to do it together, and then they can purchase something larger. So you know, like uh, on insurance, if you went to insure something that was multi billions of dollars and the insurance company can't afford that loss, but they want that policy, they may get three or four other insurance companies to share that risk with them and then they syndicate it. So that's the same same purpose of what we're doing with multifamily. You know, we're saying, look, this is a six million dollar property. This is 150 units, so six and a half million dollars contract. But I don't have six and a half million. You know, the bank will take care of uh, about Four, four and a half, four point seven million. But I got to come up with the rest, and I, I still don't have that much. The down payment is one point six, um, and then there's you know, some renovation costs. Like, so what do I do? I find other people that have it. So we put together a syndication. We hire an attorney to do all the legal stuff, so we can we get that taken care of, and, and then we can officially ask people for money. And we'll talk about the different types. So when you put that syndication, you know, what, what are you getting paid for? So you got all these people paying you for it, and you have no money out of pocket. So, so there are some things you get paid when you put the deal together. Uh, it's called an acquisition fee. So it's similar to uh, what you may get as a, a realtor fee, but you're just charging a fee, you know, maybe two, three percent to put the deal together. Uh, so you get that exposure. We've got uh, asset management, so typically that's about one and a half, two percent. So you're paying yourself to manage the property, or more manage the assets. So you're not doing the property management. Uh, maybe I'll explain the difference there. So you got a property manager that you're going to hire, so you don't want to work on the property, and then you've got to manage that property management. So you're going to have to call them, make sure they're doing their job, make sure they're managing property correctly and you're not letting it run down. Um, you're also going to want to communicate with your investors. They're going to want to know how their deal is doing. So you want to send them communications to say, you know, here's, here's what we've done to the property, here's some of the additions we've done. And just generally keep them happy. Um, so you're going to organize the financing. There's, there's always the original financing. So you're going to purchase but a lot of times you're gonna have to refinance that so if there's a lot of value add you may have to get a bridge loan um, and then that's usually about two years and then once you get everything fixed up you're gonna go to refinance it uh, hopefully with a agency debt which is gonna be a lot better or like a family or credit uh, and then you're gonna organize the sale of course so setting up the sale Negotiating that with the sale, that's, that's on you. Um, and you usually get paid a small transaction fee for that as well. So now we'll talk about how you break up that pie. So you've got all these pieces of the pie that somebody's got to get. Um, so you've got your investors, they get the biggest share. Usually you're going to give them, you know, I've seen anywhere from 50 to 80% of the deal. The most common is 70. So you're gonna you're gonna go out and you're gonna raise. So I'll use my my private current deal. We're trying to raise two million dollars. So at that two million dollars, whatever percentage of that they get, they usually get a percentage of the seventy percent of the deal. Um, so they they get the largest share. They're the ones that brought the money. They're the ones taking the biggest hit. And so we will actually buy into that. I have two other partners on that. We will actually buy some of that limited partnership. Um, and the sponsor, that's the general partnership. So that's typically, you're gonna have those two parts. You're gonna have the, the general and the limited partner. Um, so I would be the general partner with my two partners. Um, so that's the main part. But then you may not have what it takes to get the financing. So you may need to have somebody sign on, called a key principal. 
um, so that we may bring out and uh, you know, give it some presentation. So what they're going to need is uh, at least 125 percent net worth of the loan value. Like if you're borrowing a million dollars, you're going to need 1.25 million in net worth. Um, and then uh, usually lenders are different, but usually about a year's worth of payments in liquid cash. So um, there's no hard, steadfast rule, but we give them 10% on the general partnership. If we were doing that, we're not doing it on this particular deal, but um, so that's how that would work. And then that's quite a bit too much, but all this is negotiable. So there's no there's no rules, you know, how you have to structure it. Um, the money raiser, this should take a lot of fear out of, you know, Mike, when you talked about worrying about raising the money or having, you know, to get to know them. So typically you'll start with friends and family, you know, you'll go through those and you'll be surprised who has money. There's people that come out of the woodwork and never think they have money, they, they do. Um, but let's say you, you know, let's say you need the three million, and we get to like one and a half million, we're out, or maybe even a million, we can't find any more. You can bring somebody in uh, into your general partnership, give them a piece, and then you use his net worth or her net worth and take their money. In. And so you're, you're kind of giving them a portion to help bring in the money. So that's. I think that's kind of one of the biggest key parts. You know, people think they don't know people with money, which I challenge you that you do. But um, you can find somebody that, that has the connections to do it. And the bigger the deal, the easier that becomes to find. So if you're doing like a, you know, a fiveplex, nobody's going to be interested in selling shares in that. But you're talking about a 100 or 200 unit complex, we'll, we'll definitely jump in on that. Um, and then sourcing the deal. So for you to do wholesaling, you know, I, I know John is going to be coming next time, I guess, for wholesaling apartments. So I don't think John does this, but you know, you can wholesale for just a fee. You know, if you just want to say, hey, you know, I got it under contract for this. Here's, you know, mark up twenty thousand, and I'll sell it to you. Somebody who's willing to buy it. But we can actually give you a part of the GP. So if you bring us a deal that we're interested in, and uh, you know, depending on the deal, you negotiate the terms and say, "Hey, I want five percent of the GP," and, and then you own a part of the a part of that business. The beautiful part of that is, if you want to do a deal on your own, you have to have some experience um, if you're going to get financed. They're going to say, "I did not mention that on the deal." So he also has to own similar sized buildings. How do you get that thing if you don't have it? But so if you source a deal and you own five percent, they don't ask how much you own. If you own five percent of a deal that we do, you own it. Um, and I'm sure most other people that are doing syndications would probably allow you to do that. But they may prefer to pay you cash because it's it's a one-time fee and it's usually a lot less money. This, you know, if I give you a portion of the company, I pay it for eight years, it gives you more money. Um, so. Do we have any questions on, on that part so far? Anything else? Just to shut? I had a 16 unit in Wayne. <coughs> I paid for that uh, 2,600 grand. So they didn't offer it. Well, so 18, they might not have syndicated it. They may have paid just their own funding. Oh, yeah, their own funding. So when it gets to a certain point, so usually 24 in this area is about the cutoff, depending on. Know what city, but that's where it ends up being about a million because we need it to be worth about a million dollars. At 18, unless it was like Pluto Hills, it's not a million. Did you have questions? Maybe show me. All right. So either I'm really clear on this or I'm just really confused all the time. Yeah. Yeah, 
It could fit in all of them. So I think you're asking, what is the, the responsibility of the key principle? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. So it, really nothing. <coughs> I mean, really his his uh, his net worth is all, all we need there. So he's not involved. I mean, he can be if you want him to be. But really, he's got to sign on the on the dotted line. That's it. So he's done. He just collects a check for the next, for as long as you want him. <coughs> it a different way. I think yeah, it was a good question. So, so I'm going to be the general partnership by myself, and then I got a deal. Let's say it's a million dollar deal, and I, I need to get the money to do it. So, you guys are all my friends and family, and I say, hey, I need to raise uh, you know, two hundred thousand dollars for this property. So I'll, I'll go and I'll say, hey, I need anybody's got fifty grand. So you guys are going to come up. So you guys that have the fifty thousand, you'll be part of the limited partnership, and then I'll be the general partner. So the general partnership basically has uh, control. They're the ones doing the action and the work. The limited partnership is just some passive investors. So you, you have no no say in other than you give money to pay for it and you expect a return. So that's that's the simple part of it. But if I need somebody to sign for it, then I have to bring in somebody. So let's say you've got the, the massive net worth. I'll, I'll go up to you. Um, what was your name? Was it? Emmett. Emmett? Yeah, so I'll, I'll say, hey, Emmett, I know you got a bunch of money. I need you to sign for this. All you got to do is go into the, the lender. Go ahead. Oh, uh, all you got to do is go to the lender and get us secured. I've got all these people gave me the 200000 I need. And that, you know, so I talked to Leticia. So I'll go to Leticia and say, hey, can I get the loan? She'll say, yes, but you don't qualify. I need somebody that's got you know, a bunch of money sitting in the bank. They go to Emmett. He's got the money. And now we paid you a part. I gave you a part of my general partnership as incentive to sign for that. And at $50,000, which you raised, is now paid. Is that correct? Yes. So on, like a, on a typical house, if you, if you need you know, a $100,000 house, just same number is different way to look at it. And the bank says they need 20%. You need 20 grand. So it's a down payment. So this is just a million and two hundred thousand, which I've raised from a few people in here, and then they paid for it. But but then I, then they need somebody that has the bankroll to do it. And that's why I brought you in for the key principle. Does that straighten that out a little bit? Yeah, it sounds like in limited investors they bring in the down payment. The key guy, the key principle, he has the uh, access to the rich capital of the bank to keep you know financial. Again, on a house, you know, if I was going to buy a house, I have to sign for it. They're going to check my credit. They're going to check me and make sure I can buy it. You can't really do this on a house. Like have your, your brother sign for it instead. But you know, in an apartment, you can. You can just bring in somebody else that, that has the credit worthiness or uh, financial statements to do that. And then I guess the, the other two would talk, or the, the money raisers is another part. So if I could only get, if, if we only had 150000 out of that 200 you guys are all the people I know. So I may I may go to you, Emmett, and say, hey, do you have any you know, other people that could bring you up an extra fifty thousand and I'll give you a little extra extra portion to bring in somebody else in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good questions. Thank you. Yeah. Mike? 
Decision of when it goes hard, that's written in your purchase agreement. Um, so you want, as you're buying, you want that to be as far out as possible and as many outs as possible. So you're going to have to use this, you know, lending clause because you can't get it financed within a certain time. You can be out. <coughs> you're going to you're try and get as many clauses in there as possible, and the seller's going to try and pull as many out. Um, so they want to get paid for you wasting your time if it doesn't close. Um, yeah, I did not put that part on here. I'm glad you brought that up. So it's called risk capital. Um, so that's another part of the GP. So if I didn't have the, the earnest money, um, I may go to somebody and say, I'll give you a portion of the GP. But I'm going to probably need eighty to 100000 in, in earnest money. And on that deal, probably much less, probably closer to 50000 But So typically, it's about 1% EMD. Uh, sometimes they want more, especially if they're new, because they, they want to make sure you're sure. That's a good point. So you, you use the investor's money as opposed to the positive Yeah, it would, it's a different investor because the investors are on the limited partner. They're passive. But you're bringing in somebody as, as a, on, on the general partnership side. So you're still going to raise the 200000 for the uh, for the earnest money, or not the earnest money, for the deposit. But you're going to need risk capital. So you're going to pay your attorney. It's usually ten, fifteen thousand dollars to write up the syndication paperwork. Which disappears, so that's that's a big risk on on the person doing risk capital. That's probably the hardest part to sell. I, I've not yet tried to sell that portion of it, but I know that I would have a hard time giving somebody that much cash to risk. You know, like you know, because what kind of fees would they want for something like that? You know, well, you give them a portion of the, of the property, so they would they would be part of the in theory, they get it all back, so they should get everything back for closing. But they gotta, they gotta know who they are. So that's probably one of the trickiest parts, I would say, if you, if you really have no money, is getting that part. Um, fortunately, I don't have a lot of experience on that. The EMD, I've, I've had enough to cover that stuff, so that's right. uh, a little bit different situation. But you could find somebody to do it. Uh, you know, on this, on the current deal I have, I have two other partners that have much more experience than I do. They could do as much as they wanted to by themselves, and then they would just get a larger portion of the deal. Yeah, because it's tricky for it, and once the money goes hard, then you still want to make sure everybody gets paid, right? Yeah. So what happens if something falls apart, and all of a sudden that investor money goes down to the down the tube? <coughs> they can, so yeah. Uh, they had um, they had eighty thousand dollars hard that they didn't close on just before we partnered. They did end up getting it back because it was because of the seller was dishonest. Uh, they found out some things that they had just lied to him. Now he's got some stunning legal fees on it. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean he probably still lost. I think he said like fourteen to twenty or something in that range. But, um, but yeah, he he told the guy he goes, "You're going to give me the hard money back for for this fee report." Right. And the, you know the the funny thing was the guy was like, "Oh, it's just part of the business." It's not. I mean, it may have happened to you, but you know, we're not trying to screw everybody over. But, you know. so, yeah. And then within the investor group, any of the people from sponsor down can become investors also, or you need that money to go to other people that want the money raised. Yeah. Um, so of course, the um, so you're going to want to start networking immediately for like the money raising and things like that, but. Um, so we we are putting in our own money. We'll probably put a good portion of our own money into this deal, depending on how much we raise and what our situations are. But so that way, we'll own the general partnership and part of the limited partnership. Um, and 
everybody's welcome to do that. I mean, obviously, we want to fill up that, that money as quick as possible. And then the money raiser, those are a lot easier to find than you think. You know, somebody that, <coughs> a friend of mine that we met, he, he works uh, at Walmart, so they're pretty high up at Walmart. So, I mean, everybody he works with makes you know, well over half a million dollars a year. Uh, so he knows a lot of people with deep pockets that can use to bring in that money. So he's a good backer. So if I can't raise it all, we can bring it in. Good question. Hey, Mark? <coughs> <laughs> there you go. There we go. All right, so now, what about the SEC? So this is what made me nervous for the longest time getting into this, because there's, there is no black and white rules for SEC regulations. Unfortunately, if you talk to three attorneys, you're going to get three different answers on what you can do, can't do. Uh, so again, everything I say is a lie, but there's some general guidelines for how that works. So it's, it's Regulation D. So typically, if you sell a security, you are going to have to follow a lot of very strict reporting rules um, and very expensive reporting rules that the big companies like Coca-Cola and Apple all have to do. But for the little guys like us, or me at least, we, uh, you know, we, don't, we don't have multi-billion dollar companies to do that. So we have two exceptions that, that the SEC has given us. There's 506B. So 506B is for your friends and family. That's that's what I do, and probably most of you I would suggest you do. Um, so the reason it's friends and family is you can have 35 non-accredited investors. So if your mother, your father, or maybe they got an extra 50 grand in the bank, but they're not, uh, they don't fit an accredited investor, um, then maybe you can get money from them. So I think personally that's going to be the easiest. Everybody I know is doing that. Uh, there are some big players that do. So they do have to be sophisticated. Uh, sophisticated basically means they are competent enough to know what they're doing. So basically, you know, they don't want you to take advantage of somebody that doesn't understand why they're giving you their money. Uh, so that would be taking advantage of somebody that maybe is just not competent enough to quite understand what they're doing. So is that a second category, or is it um, friends and family who are sophisticated? Yeah, so they have to be sophisticated, but generally it just means that they're capable of knowing what they're doing. Okay. So if, if they can explain back to you why they're giving you the money, then you're probably okay. okay. But so it's kind of a gray area on that, but sophisticated just means they understand what they're doing. So if you had somebody, I don't know what words I want to use, so I'm not offending anybody, but if you had somebody that just didn't understand, or maybe they had a ton of money, but they weren't very intelligent. You, know, you can't con them out of the money. So that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to protect people. Um, so with the friends and family, you can't I advertise. So clearly, if it's just people that you know, advertising would defeat that purpose. So I probably remember that. But. So then there's the 506 C. And again, the big difference is you can advertise for the 506 C. Only use accredited investors. Uh, you can usually get them uh, verified to a third party that they are accredited. So, uh, Frank, you probably know accredited that term. But uh, so you mix with the note? What's that? Can you mix both? No. So if you advertise, then you're then you're out. So you'd be in the 506 C. So what they're saying is on the friends and family, you need to know them and have an established relationship. Now there's another gray area. What's an established relationship? Um, so there's a few gray rules on that, but um, I don't so want to. If you don't advertise and you have a credit investor, though, it's okay. Say that again? If you don't advertise still, but you find them as an accredited investor, you don't have a breach of the established relationship. Does that work? Yeah. So if you don't know them, then, then they should be in the 506 But if you, the 506C, you should know who they are. You might get away with it. So, uh, so I've had attorneys tell me that you might get away with it. 
I wouldn't recommend it when you talk to your attorney first, but when they are accredited, the, the SEC doesn't ask as many questions. And so the government says if you have reached a certain level of money, well, that they don't need to protect you. So if you haven't reached that level, the government says that they need to protect you from you. Does that make sense? So if they are accredited, they won't ask as many questions. <clears throat> With them being accredited, say you have like an uncle that I met who's also happens to be an attorney. I'm an accredited investor. If he got accredited, would disqualify it from public review to exempt from being said non accredited? Uh, so you can have unlimited accredited and up to 35 non accredited. Oh, okay. But you have to have a relationship with that. Right. Good question. What are you were saying? As long as you know everybody that's involved in the 506 B and good matter, you're done. Yeah. It doesn't matter if they're accredited or not. The thing is, you can if, if you of the bucket of people you have, up to 35 of them can be non accredited max. So you could have 500, but only 35 can be non accredited. But if you know the rest of them personally and they're all loaded, you can use them. You, just, you already knew them, you didn't ask them. But if you look at through what is it, the co partnership or the money raiser, the partnership for the money raiser that can be so you can get 35 for you, 35 for them, 35 for you spread out that way. No, so you still have a limit of 35, but you don't want to structure it too much. You don't really want to have 35 investors anyway. Right. So if we're raising a million dollars, you know, you usually want to add up to 20. So depending on how much you want to raise, you want to get whatever 20 investors will do. Um, you know, because if you've got Let's say 200 investors that you've got to write and explain to how the department's doing every month. Mm -hmm. well, you know, many of those are going to have a lot of questions, and it would just be overwhelming to answer all of them. Mm -hmm. So if you got 20, then you could probably handle all those questions in an hour. Well, the price is small at that point anyway. Yeah. You know, 200 people taking a couple seconds to send versus 30 people taking a couple seconds to send would be a big old sale. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and you know, another way to look at it too is if you bring in somebody, let's say you're bringing people in at ten grand, you know, the likelihood that you're going to have somebody invest ten grand that, that isn't really attached to that money is, is small, and you know, I don't want to take somebody's money that's going to put them in a spot where it, it hurts them because that money's not liquid by the deal's done. So they're out. That money's gone for eight years, five to eight years, however long you hold for. It's gone. I mean, they can't get it back. They're getting paid quarterly, but uh, you know, if they have a, a medical situation and they need the money back, it doesn't work. You know, when somebody has, they can give you ten grand. Maybe that's all that they had in their bank. They're gonna be calling you every month, like every week. You know, what's going on? I saw somebody moving out. You know, like what's going on? You know, but you got a guy with two, three, four hundred thousand in the bank. I mean, he's worried, but he's probably not, probably not calling you anyway. So, there's no law against that. It's just personal. You know, what, what you want to look for. Um, so, the, the accredited, you know, I don't know if you care about the actual terms, but according to the government, this is what they consider you smart enough that they don't have to watch you. Um, so, a net worth of $1 million, uh, excluding your primary residence. I think if you're married, it's like one is higher, but not much. Um, or have income of at least 200000 each year for the last two years, or 300 if you combine the needs of spouse. Um, so anyway, that's accredited. But if you're doing a 506C and you're getting accredited investors, you're going to want to make sure that um, you're going to have a third party validate that. So, you know, I. I can't just somebody can't just say, "Hey, I'm accredited. Here's my money." You'd have to have, you know, Frank or third party service would be better. But I, Frank, you can write a letter for us, right? Yeah, I mean for for a client, but truly, what what I see is is still sometimes a relationship where somebody knows that person <coughs> and these people step 
over sometimes, but um, truly then it would be in best interest to validate that what they're qualified because just signing in and getting a letter even from a CPA or some advisor, I would think cover yourself because if you didn't do the proper due diligence, it would always come back to you. And it's only going to come back to you if, if the deal goes south and it really is a good deal. No one will ever know, but people do skirt the line, I think, sometimes on that and what qualifies as an accredited investor getting into the estate. Um, when it goes south, people want to say something else. So you're getting into securities, and that's where covering. Yeah, that, that's a good point. So I hear a lot of people who do apartments legally, you know, and they're like, oh, I've been doing this, or I do that. It, it's never a problem until you lose money. So, you know, uh, the PPM, a, a really long document that says this is a riskier endeavor. You can and could lose all of your money, yada, 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 and all the risks. And you're signing that saying, yes, I understand what I'm getting into. Um, if you don't do it correctly, Money, and then you go to the SEC, and then you're in trouble. I mean, I've seen C deals that key office people that I know are not accredited investors, just through knowing them, are in those deals, and it's just or other situations, but those all work out good. Nobody ever cares, but when they get in there, then you know they're running the ball with those guys. Yeah. And you know, I mean, it's possible. I mean, anybody who tells you that their deal is not going to lose money, it's impossible. That is the one you do not want to invest in because it's possible. I mean, you may have a perfect track record, you may be the most reliable person, but it can happen. Plus, tax losses people don't necessarily always understand as far as tax losses and cash flow and how that generates. You know, they're not necessarily losing. It's a good advantage, but if they're not, why should they take a big amount of money? Yeah, and hopefully, you know, hopefully you're, you're explaining that clearly. But hope you've explained it well enough in the beginning. Yes. You know, so that when when things happen, that they're expecting that and they, they understand what's going on. But um, so where should you invest? Now that again could be a huge topic. Um, so I, I tried to simplify it. Number one, I say stay where you feel comfortable. So I don't feel comfortable in the city of Detroit. Mike, you said you have one in the city of Detroit. So it would not be smart for me to buy in Detroit, but for you, it would be. You understand the market, you understand maybe Emmett can find us something with the city, but, um, but you know, so your home market is always the best. You can make it there quick. Um, personally, I can say I've lost the deal because I wasn't local, which is really frustrating. But Another story, but so that's why I think the home market is best. You get a, a lot of home court advantages um, when you do manage it. You can get there and drive by and make sure that there's not a bunch of garbage on your property. Um, so the wholesalers will probably sympathize with this. So where do you find a deal? Um, so the big one that everybody everybody hates, but but everybody loves LoopNet. Um, there is, believe it or not, there are good deals on LoopNet. I know nobody wants to admit that there is, but uh, a lot of them are, are on, they start on there. Maybe they don't look like a good deal at first, but somebody's got to buy it. You know, if, if, you, if they want $20 million for a $10 million property, it's not going to go for $10 million. So if you're the only one that makes a offer, they might take it. Uh, brokers. So probably 90% of your deals are going to come from brokers. So you would think that this would be a fairly easy task, but that's where I see a lot of people fail, is picking up the phone, calling brokers, and telling them what you're looking for. Hey, um, Mike, I'm looking for a 24 unit, give or take 10 in, in the city of Detroit, in this neighborhood. Uh, you know, do you have anything? Nope. Okay, let me know what you do, and then just follow up with them. Uh, Kind of like tracking a lead, like, like you guys do, or like Todd will teach you on trying to buy a house from somebody. You're, 
to tell them, hey, I want you to think of me. Would you find a deal with this lease right here? And if you can get one to do it and send it to me, you're a good deal. So most most deals don't make it to LoopNet because the brokers don't want to deal with somebody they haven't dealt with. So if they know you, they might bring it to you and give you the chance to buy it before they sell it. Because that's what they care about is selling. They don't necessarily care about trying to put it on the market and have a bunch of people fight over it. If they know they want five million for a property and you'll give them five million, they're going to take it. Mark? So, like, commercial real estate is 100% different than residential. Like the MLS can go in there and say, find property. In a commercial arena, commercial brokers don't like to co build they like to keep 100% of the commission. Uh, it's a dog eat dog. So when you're chasing the apartments, you got to go talk to all those guys, you know, to get a major in the network to find the deal. And yeah. in my world, you need to never try to touch. I'm a realtor. I can get commissions. I never try to touch your commission. I want to get a good deal. So you got to become their friend. Uh, his cold calling techniques is you got him on the phone. So 
and you call them. I, so this is one task I would not have a virtual assistant do. Because number one, I get them on the phone and say, hey, I'd like to buy your apartment. And they say, no, I'm not looking to buy. So I say, well, are you looking to acquire more? And if you are, would you be interested in looking at some deals that I get and kind of send them your way? So now I got contact with somebody making money for it, or maybe a few principals. Um, and then, you know, lately I've been asking them if they want to do a podcast. And then, uh, you know, if they, if they really sound like somebody I want to meet, you know, maybe take them out to lunch or something. Um, so, what do you feel that you look at that you don't particularly like for whatever reason you could always run your buy list or email it to them? Yeah. So I got, a, yeah, I have a whole list of people I talk to. You know, if, if a couple of them are interested, then that's fine. I mean, I so if you can send them out to you. Right. So, yeah, you know, in fact, the, the deal that I'm negotiating currently, the the seller we met from cold calling, and the two partners that I have I met through cold calling. So, you know, we, you know, cold calling is totally different on apartments than it is single family. So, Todd, I mean, you've done a lot of cold calling. You get a lot of, why are you talking to me? Why are you calling me? Or how'd you get my number? And you know, a lot of negativity. Lots of cuss words come back at you. Um, in, in apartments, I mean, I really haven't had any that really were negative. I mean, uh, you know, the partners that I have on this deal, I mean, his words were, hey, you know, that's awesome. That's how I got started, was cold calling and doing this. You know, it's exciting. Whatever you need, let me know and I'll help you out. Because they know they're all investors. You know, in a home, you're calling somebody that has probably mismanaged their funds in some way. That's how you got the number. And, uh, but apartments, you're, you're calling in another investor who knows exactly why you're calling them. He knows that there's resources to get his number, and, and they get it. So they're okay with it. Um, I don't know, that's, that's what I have. I don't know if anybody have any other ideas for that, Todd. Any other things that I'm missing? No, I like that. that you don't check the yeah, I, I shouldn't share it, but the cold calling is, is, <laughs> is awesome. I, mean, I love it. So. Um, one thing I, I haven't tried yet to add it on there is, is I'm going to start with asking them on the podcast first. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> because I've been getting uh, a lot of people that think I'm a broker, and I have to really clarify that I'm not trying to list the property. I want to buy it myself. Um, and I think if I start off with the podcast, I might change the, the mood. So yeah, I'll, I'll follow up with you guys and let you know how that goes on. So I'm just curious on, uh, you mentioned you can call on apartment owners. So how do you get that list on do you go to public records? And, how do you, and then how do you find these people? So um, I got the initial list through CoStar, uh, which says, uh, I wouldn't recommend paying for that <laughs> because it, it's very inaccurate. When you talk to them, they say, we well, got the numbers of almost everybody. <laughs> well, blah, blah, they do not. So, um, but it is a complete list of all the apartments. I have some resources that I don't know how they would do it. I didn't have MLS resources on my tax books, but uh, our Michigan website, it's a, it's a Michigan.gov website. Um, I don't remember that just to tell you, I just have it bookmarked, but you, know, uh, you can go and look up the uh, an entity there and, and look it up. <coughs> you can see who the MLS is. Yeah, a lot of So you go to PRU, public records, <coughs> find out if there's an LLC or whatever. <coughs> then you go to Lara and you find out. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, so my, my virtual assistant uses my life, uh, which is like super cheap. I don't know, like 20 bucks a year or something. It was, it was pretty cheap. Um, and then you can type in their name and it'll give you, it's not very reliable on phone numbers, but it's very reliable on have her send all of the emails out when those come by and then uh, anytime I can get a phone number, sometimes CoStar has phone numbers or my life will have it. Um, you know, we'll use those. Did, did you have a question back there? Yeah, is that my life with an M? Yeah, like like M Y L I F E. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. I don't remember the price, but it's, it's really cheap, so I recommend it even if you're doing single family. So but um, so public records, then do that up and then 
there are some other methods of, of looking up phone numbers that, that I haven't had to get too deep into. I, I, the list is so big, I haven't got to the point of exhausting those resources. But, um, there's lots of stick trace websites out there, which Tom's probably much more familiar with than I am. But, um, how do you find the reaching out to email versus calling? Uh, so the email is much more quantity because I'm paying somebody else to do it. So it's my, my you know, one or two hours a day of calling that, that reaches like three people. <laughs> you know, because uh, you know, the, the quantity is just not as much. You know, when I can pay somebody for eight hours, it's just and most of it's automated through Podio. Somebody mentioned they're using Podio, and it just ships them all out. That's the so the quantity responses is much more on email because I'm not physically using it. You can do a video email or video texting and stuff like that. <coughs> Good luck with it. Thank you. 
Dave Tupin, uh, I believe it's T O U P I N. He's actually he actually owns some stuff here locally, and recently just moved out of town. But I think he has a, a big apartment in Rome. <coughs> but pretty sharp kid. Sixteen, because I think he's like twenty. But <laughs> so yeah, I I recommend the DLA online group. I think um, I really just don't think. Mark, you can maybe or tell me differently, but I, I really don't think you can really get a fair offer price without really digging into everything and what it really is. Because uh, a lot of those numbers for the NOI are going to change in that operating income. You know, that like their taxes is going to be different for you, so either it's going to be more. Um, you know, hopefully you can bring the rent up. You know, you're going to have a value add, which is going to change the returns. Yes. What do you see? What type of return do your uh, investment partners want to continue to have? What type of return are you looking for? Uh, well, so mine is infinite. <laughs> if I'm not putting in, right? So limited partnerships, uh, usually they're looking for a cash on cash of between 9 and 11. Um, and then usually the average annual return they want up at 10, 15. Uh, so, and where they're getting the, making that up is at the sale. You know, hopefully you get a big chunk. So I'm going to say I heard this, but this is how I would approach buying an apartment. Uh, it's all a numbers game. So you've got to generate as many, you've got to generate a ton of leads. So what I'm going to do, what I would want to do is eventually know if Buffett or Angel or Angel is the one. It's like critical of this because what you want to do is you want to be able to email broadcast out to every apartment owner in the U.S things you can find. You want to gather their phone numbers. Some simple, real simple systems of doing that would be you can get yellow page scraper and you can scrape all the apartment owners in the U.S. and give you their email addresses and their phone numbers. But you need a really robust email broadcast system that you're not going to find you know, quite in the U.S. I picked up Russian and Indian food where when you're emailing somebody that, that you don't know, most of the U.S. systems want that person to opt into. So I'm going to find a system that doesn't require that. All the regulations require is when you email somebody that they can opt out. Okay, and the reason, there's two ways you can gather somebody's email. It's implied if it's somewhere on the internet. Or they get it. Okay, so I'm going to focus on major scraping on whatever system I can find. I'll do the same thing on the phone number. And uh, I'm going to text blast to buy text blast from the internet really cheap. Really cheap. Now I ask you this question. Who do you know that doesn't need their text blast? So I'm telling you like the real market truth. So then I'm going to text blast those apartment owners and I'm knowing not then to offer money on an offer that they donate the property round one. Because if they're looking to donate, they are motivated. People don't donate properties because they're one minute to the As a general rule, people don't donate properties because they want to make a difference for charity. They donate properties because they don't want it. And you're spelling out all the tax benefits to a property owner if they're a corporation and they're profitable and they can spend the same of their earnings carry them forward up to five years and apply it if they're an individual person up to 30 percent off their adjusted gross income and carry it forward. So you're starting to hit them with where it counts. And now in the second round, then I'll say I'm a cash buyer. So I'm going to approach it a second time. So all I want to do is just generate as many leads as I can coming in. Does that make sense to everybody? So you're going to need to know people that can get you that kind of that's how I would approach it to generate a lot of leads. Because I don't people calling me to tell me they want to sell their property. Yeah. But so all, all we're doing is a numbers game. Then I plug in all those crazy commercial brokers and it's the same thing because they don't talk 
talking to, to buyers or you know, brokers are going to know what to give you, but if you're talking to a seller directly, um, there are two key things you want to ask for if you can get anything from them. Sometimes they're going to be hesitant to give you stuff. But you want a 212 and a rental. Um, and those two items you'll plug into your deal analyzer, whichever one you're using, and um, you know, it should spit out a decent number uh, of all what you want to pay for that place. Uh, so things to consider, you know, you want value add. Um, so there's a couple ways you can do that. You can raise the rents and you can lower the expenses. And that's how you're going to add value. So that's why you're, you're willing to pay a little bit more than that typical cap rate because you're going to add that value in um, and hopefully get your, your money that way. Um, when you're syndicating, really, you, from my experience, you need a, a value add because those, you're splitting the pie with a lot of people. So you're going to need to be able to pay all those people and still make a profit on it. Um, so you want to look at their, their net operating income. We talked a little bit about that. Now both lowering expenses or raising the rent's going to change that. Um, so you want to you know, look at some sources to look at their market or their rents. So you look at apartments.com. Uh, although I don't really trust it a lot for apartments, uh, Rental meter is a decent place to start. But I do like apartments.com to get an idea of what the area is looking at. When you get a little bit more serious, you can call some of the apartments in the area, ask them what one bedroom or two bedroom it goes for. Um, and that's going to give you an idea of where yours could be. So you might have one that, you know, if you look at the rent roll and he's getting 550 a door, but everybody else in the city is getting 650. You know, that tells you something. But then you really want to know, especially like Detroit, you want to know that neighborhood because you may be getting 650 one block over, but there's a reason that yours is 550 and it has nothing to do with the, the landlord. So you really want to know that it's not just, uh, you know, that could be a little just two blocks down. Uh, again, that's why the home court advantage is helpful. That's why I say out of Detroit because it does have all these little markets that I don't I don't know and I just really haven't taken the time to know that. And, and so if I invest in Detroit, I'm certain I would lose money. Um, and then you want to look at your estimated capital expenditures. So that's going to have a huge difference on, on your numbers. So if an apartment property is well maintained and you're only putting in maybe a hundred thousand dollars to get it up, maybe you just never raised the rent because you was lazy. Didn't want them to leave or for whatever reason. Um, but I mean, you may have parking lots and roofs, and those things add up really, really fast. Uh, and, and what those do is they add more money that you have to raise. So the more money you have to raise, the less return that they're going to get. So you're spreading out the same profits with more people. So any other questions on that part of it? Explain that. That's a T12 is a trailing 12 months, so you don't want to look at like 2018 returns. You know, like we're halfway into 2019, so you want to say uh, up till April of 2019, and you're going to look at 2018 from May, June, July, and so forth. So you're looking at the last 12 months. And that's the 12 months of income or expenses or both? Both. Yeah, so you're going to look at, so you, and they're all broke down differently. Essentially, it's going to show your, your gross rents minus your vacancies, concessions. Uh, concessions are money that you get for them to move in or to be leased. Um, and then you're going to have maybe laundry income or you know, that, you know, maybe some utility lines to pay that. And then, then we're going to start getting all your expenses. And you'll have your net operating income at the bottom. Okay, so now the most important part, excuse me, so 
you have no excuses to move forward. You can definitely, uh, it's something you can do no matter what your experience is, you can get any part. Um, you know, like we talked about, all you have to do is find a deal. Marketing is a great example of finding them. Um, I, I think I agree with Sue that it gets you a deal. Find somebody out there, and there's a ton of people that will buy a deal. I'm sure most of them will give you the money that you ask for. They'll probably prefer to give you a solid price, but if you give them money, so if you tell them, look, I'm, I'm, I want in on the deal. They don't really have to say this, but they pass on the deal. So there's no excuses. The biggest thing I see with people failing in any real estate adventure or even any dream that they may have is getting off the couch and doing it. You know, it's, it's the people that, that come to the class and they stop. Or I think Mark or Todd mentioned, you, know, you pay tens of thousands of dollars for a training course or a mentor, and then that's it. I mean, you, don't, you just threw the money away. So you have to do it. And, and I don't know anybody that I've seen that I've known that has crushed it, you know, like they're just working and making calls and going out there that has failed. And Todd, you've seen a lot of people. You can tell right away when they're going to make it. I mean, you and I have talked about people before they've ever made it. And they're going to be great. And today, they are because they have written to be a great mentor. Um, you know, we talked about him and how he crushed it. So that's the biggest difference. Whether you believe in yourself or you think you don't have any experience or maybe you tried and failed, that's something you just got to keep doing it and you will be successful. I like uh, Grant.